Hello, good afternoon. My name is Simon Rule. I'm a haematologist here in Plymouth, UK. I'm also a professor at the local medical school. Today I want to discuss an elderly patient with mantle cell lymphoma, which is the kind of patient that I see not infrequently because I have a relatively large population of patients and these are patients that haven't been referred in a tertiary perspective, so, so a local patient uh, with multiple comorbidities and how one approaches the management of these people where clinical trial evidence is not available. So the case is a 75 year old farmer who presented with an auxiliary mass and the mass in auxiliary was so large he walked in with his arm like this with, with the mass under his axilla. He told me that he'd only just noticed it and um, what was slightly odd is his wife who accompanied him said that she only just noticed it as well. Now, you clearly know that isn't the case but there's no point challenging there's a lot of denial going on there and that is a, that's an issue I think maybe it's not unique to the UK where we do see late presentation, sometimes dramatically late presentation, this is a good example. Nonetheless, you are faced with a patient with an illness and you have to deal with it, the, 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 the history is irrelevant. So this guy has a lot of weight loss and I think the weight loss plus the lump told him he had cancer which made him worried and hence the very late presentation. He'd lost at least two stone in weight, um, a lot of night sweats, a lot of fevers and on examination multiple lymph node sites, the, the most dramatic being in the axilla. Um, on staging, he had lymphoma on both sides of the diaphragm. Uh, for, sorry, firstly, I should say that the biopsy of the mass showed that he had mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, it was classical mantle cell lymphoma, low key 67, as is often the case, 20%, uh, both sides of the diaphragm and also in the bone marrow. So, stage 4 disease. Um, again, didn't do a PET scan, we don't routinely do PET scanning in this situation. But he did have quite a dramatic change in bowel habit, uh, which had been evident over the previous three to four months. So almost certainly he had disease within his bowel as well. So he had disease everywhere, large mass, a lot of big symptoms. So on the face of it, uh, an elderly man and clinical trial evidence would point you at a number of potential regimens there. CHOP with rituximab, bendamustine with rituximab, a uh, number of other potential drugs with rituximab, endomustine, arasi, for example, uh, lower doses of arasi. However, this 75-year-old gentleman is a diabetic. He's quite a badly controlled diabetic on oral hyperglycemic agents. He's had two coronary artery bypass grafts in the last five years. He's on a host of uh, medications from a cardiac perspective. He can't walk more than 50 yards on the flat without getting short of breath. He's obese, uh, morbidly obese, and he's got active leg ulcers that uh, on a monthly basis require antibiotics and dressing from district nursing. So you're faced with a man who has just about every comorbidity one could imagine uh, and a malignancy that requires some form of uh, therapy. So what do you do? Well, there are scores that you can use to assess uh, comorbidities in elderly patients. These are quite lengthy and complex but a man that can't get out of his chair and walk across the waiting room uh, without getting short of breath, you don't need complex scores to tell you this man is not going to tolerate chemotherapy. Um, what one does, what I do, is uh, consider whether you think this patient would be suitable to receive an anthracycline. Actually, you could tell just from clinical examination and, uh, and the history that, that he was not a candidate for that kind of therapy. We do an echo anyway, and that showed a low ejection fraction, which was not a surprise to anybody. So what are you going to do? Um, I felt he was too frail to consider not only CHOP, but also bendamustine. Whilst bendamustine is used in elderly patients, uh, the trials are in fit elderly patients, so patients without significant comorbidities, and this guy absolutely did not have that. In my experience, bendamustine in these patients is not that well tolerated. So what does one use? Well, you need to use some form of immunochemotherapy, so rituximab, which is relatively easy to use even in these patients, added to something. And um, you've got to 
a range of options. Um, CVP, so CHOP without the anthracycline, I find quite useful in older patients. There was a trial many, many years ago in a centrocytic lymphoma of CHOP versus CVP. This is before rituximab became on the, came on the horizon, which showed no difference between those two groups. So it's very legitimate to consider CVP in this group of patients. Um, it's probably not as good as CHOP, but it's not that, that much inferior. Uh, step down from that, one could use chlorambucil. Chlorambucil, as a single agent, has activity, it's very well tolerated. And Adituritoximab has some surprisingly good responses in some patients. There have been a couple of publications looking at it, particularly uh, one from Greece, I think it was in a British Journal of Hematology. So again, well tolerated, active combination. One could think about single agent rituximab, one could think about single agent uh, chemotherapies, pure analogues, for example, thalidomide uh, can be quite active in this situation. Then if you think outside those agents, but things where, you, uh, where funding becomes an issue, particularly for me within the NHS, activity of drugs like lenalidomide, with or without rituximab, and certainly drugs um, like the new BTK inhibitors, of course not licensed for frontline therapy, but would almost certainly be very uh, effective and as they have such a good side effect profile, would be a useful thing to consider in this situation. So what did I do? Uh, I gave them Clarampsil with Rituximab, which I've used in quite a few patients now over the years who are, who are like this, often more elderly than this, and it worked very well. He, he, got, a, he got a good clinical response, um, and I gave him uh, eight cycles, I think, in total, using a flat dose of Carambosil, 10 milligrams for 10 days, with uh, rituximab on a monthly basis. Uh, very good response. Uh, he didn't like being treated, he didn't like coming to hospital. Uh, and again, this is, this is the real world, if you like. It, it's all very well talking to a patient about rituximab maintenance. But if they want to be on their farm, want to deny the fact they've got something wrong with them, then sometimes there's a degree of negotiation. So we did not engage in any maintenance. And uh, he got a good partial remission as far as the CT scan's concerned. The disease came back um, that was clinically causing him problems after about a year. And what's very interesting is that the Conversations about treatment, the options are very similar to what I was just discussing, but the patient was not uh, keen on having any treatment at all. Um, so I actually didn't have any treatment and uh, went into a palliative care situation where actually I used pulses of steroids. I find dexamethasone can be very active in, in that kind of palliative setting. It's very good at removing symptoms and it can shrink lymph nodes down quite effectively. So I went to the palliative care setting and, and, and died quite peacefully at home. Um, that, that's it. It's an interesting case in that, um, if you like, that's, that's the real world sometimes with these patients. It's all very well having the clinical trial information available, but you cannot translate clinical trial information into people like him. And also the other side of the equation is you can have the best information and uh, the most up-to-date conversations with patients and they may not accept it. And, and a lot of that has to do with personal circumstances and expectations, uh, and that was certainly the case with this guy. He was a, um, you know, a simple old farmer who, I think life and death is quite black and white if you live in that kind of uh, world, and, and that's, that's, that's how he saw it. So I think we, we probably got the best we could uh, from a quality of life perspective. Certainly didn't make him unwell with the treatment, certainly delivered some quality of life for at least a year. and and. and he was active in the decision about not to continue treatment, and I think that was probably, in, in retrospect, that was probably the, the, the right thing to do. Although it would have been nice had I had it available to have given him a BTK inhibitor, but I suspect he wouldn't have tolerated. He, I suspect he wouldn't have accepted it. That's easy, isn't it?